Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 4. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit for forty days in the wilderness, tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing in those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will give his angels charge of you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And a report concerning him went out through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and he went to the synagogue, as his custom was, on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And there was given to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let us pray. <clears throat> when morning gilds the skies, my heart awaking cries, may Jesus Christ be praised. Lord, we have some idea of what we are going to do this day, but we have no idea of what you are going to do. And we thank you for the unexpected surprises that we have in the Christian life. We thank you that you are going to do things among us today here, that you are going to touch people by your Spirit and that they will never be the same again. We thank you that you are going to teach us something that we never knew before, something that we never saw, to which we have been blind, that will open our understanding in a new way and thrill our hearts to the discovery of what you can do. We thank you that all over the world people will be born again this day. People who are living at the moment in sin, in darkness, out of touch with all that is lasting and real, and by the time the sun goes down tonight, they will be living in the kingdom they will have everlasting life. They will have begun a relationship with Jesus Christ that will never be broken. Lord, we thank you for all this. And we pray for that faith which is expectant, that faith which sets no limit to what you can do. And we pray for that responsiveness that is willing to listen 
and then to do whatever you say. We are very humbled when we think of how slowly we learn, of how reluctant we are to follow, of how disobedient we can be. Even when we know what is right, we shrink from it. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will remove all inhibitions from our souls, that there may be no fears in our hearts of what may happen if we surrender completely to your Holy Spirit, that there may be no <clears throat> reservations, no conditions that we attach. Grant that we may not be among those who said to our Lord in the days of his flesh, <clears throat> Lord, I will follow thee, but... May there be no buts in our Christian life, no withholding of what you have a right to demand, no hesitation in launching out into the deep. And what we pray for ourselves, we pray for all your people, that the world may know that the church is your church, filled with your spirit, serving your Son, looking for your glory, and we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> now, on Sunday mornings, we are looking at the subject of the Holy Spirit. And we're going right through the Bible from cover to cover. And we're asking what the whole Bible says about the Holy Spirit. From my experience, one of the reasons why people become unbalanced in one way or another when thinking of the Holy Spirit is precisely because they will not take the whole Bible. They concentrate on certain parts of it and therefore get out of balance. It's the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible that must be our basis. Now, I suppose you know that between Malachi and Matthew, if I can find it quickly, there is a gap I know you know the Old Testament ends with Malachi and the New Testament begins with Matthew, but between those two people there is a gap of 400 years and there is nothing in my Bible about that gap, nothing at all. Now that's not because there are no records and no writings for four centuries, there are. There are books called the Maccabees, books called Esdras. And these books are often lumped together and called the Apocrypha. And you may have heard of the books of the Apocrypha. If you haven't read them, you've probably heard a choir singing Judas Maccabees uh, and other mentions of these writings. Why are they not in the Bible? Why, for example, is this still one of the major points of uh, difference between the Roman Catholics and Protestants? that Protestants say those books should not be in the Bible because they are not God's word, whereas Catholics believe they are. What is the reason for leaving 400 years out of the Bible? The answer is very simple. <clears throat> there is a phrase that occurs 3,800 times in the Old Testament which doesn't occur once in the Apocrypha. And it's the phrase, thus saith the Lord. No word from God came for 400 years. To put it rather differently, there was no prophet for 400 years who could come and say, this is what God says. And so the Old Testament begins with the books of Moses, who was the first great prophet, and it ends with the book of Malachi, who was the last prophet, and the Bible does not begin again until God speaks again. And no matter how thrilling the stories of the Maccabees may be, no matter how many exciting things happened in those 400 years, the simple fact is that where the Holy Spirit is not operating on human beings, in God's eyes there's nothing worth recording. That however busy men may be, however brave they may be, however wonderful the things they do may be, in God's sight it's not worth recording if the Holy Spirit is not in it. Let me apply that to our church life. 
We keep minutes of our church meetings, of our deacons meetings. I suppose somewhere there's a pile of books like this with all the minutes of the things this church has decided and done over many years. In God's sight, the only things worth recording in our church's life are the things that have happened when the Holy Spirit has been touching men and women. The rest is human activity which may be of great interest to the historian but is of no significance eternally unless the Holy Spirit was in it. And if the Holy Spirit is not touching men, men do not speak the word of God and nothing happens that is significant. And the reason why there is nothing in my Bible of those 400 years is precisely this. The Holy Spirit did not fall upon a single man for 400 years. There is a gap in the history of God's activity, and therefore the Bible doesn't record it. What we are saying is this, that after a long, long train of prophets who were filled with the Holy Spirit from Moses to Malachi, and who said and did extraordinary supernatural things, who spoke the word of God and did the deeds of God. After all that, nothing happened for centuries. Summer came, winter came, the next summer came, and nothing happened. Nobody said, thus saith the Lord. Nobody performed any miracles. Nothing happened of God. Only human activity. So there's no point in putting those books in the Bible. They don't help us to understand God or to understand his purpose. Now, does that mean that nobody thought about the Holy Spirit for 400 years? No, it doesn't mean that. They thought about it. And I now want to pick up two threads that I dropped last Sunday morning. In the Old Testament, there were two dreams which were promised by God as real, to happen in the future, and they were these, that one day there would come from God a king who'd be filled with the Spirit and who would be able to do and say the things of God. That was one dream. And the other dream was that when he came, all the people could be filled with the Spirit as well, and God's Spirit could be poured out upon all flesh, men and women, young and old, employer and employee. Now then, those two dreams are all that I can tell you about the Holy Spirit for the 400 years between the Old and New Testament. And it must have seemed to those people that the dreams got further and further away. Nobody ever got filled with the Spirit. Nobody spoke the Word of God. Nobody performed miracles. The Spirit seemed to have gone. And yet for 400 years they waited for the Spirit to come and fill a king, a son of David, and for the Spirit to be poured out on all flesh. And they never forgot those dreams. The Jews have remarkable memories. They have remembered their holy land over 2,000 years of being out of it. They don't give up their hopes very quickly. And after 2,000 years, the Jewish hopes for a land of their own have been fulfilled. They don't forget. And they didn't forget these two dreams about the Holy Spirit. Which brings me to my subject for this morning. What does the Holy Spirit do in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? I could have taken all four Gospels, but I'd never have got a quarter through. Because John's Gospel says more than the other three. But I'm going to take the other three this morning. About the year 5 BC, according to our calendars, about the year 5 BC, the Holy Spirit began to touch people after 400 years of waiting. Ordinary people, in fact, the Holy Spirit began again to fill people and enable them to say and do supernatural things, first of all, by touching two couples, one an elderly couple, the other a young teenage couple. And the Holy Spirit began to touch these four people. 
and began to do again the things that had happened in the old days. Now the elderly couple was a couple called Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were well on in, in years. They were a godly couple. The younger couple were two teenagers engaged to be married and the name of one was Joseph and the name of the other was Mary. But after 400 years, God's Holy Spirit touched these two couples and things began to happen again. They were both childless. One because they were too old to have children and had, had none and the other because they weren't even married yet. But to both couples, the Holy Spirit gave a boy. In the one case, a boy called John. In the other case, a boy called Jesus. And humanly speaking, in neither case ought there to have been a baby at all, much less a boy. But the Holy Spirit was beginning again, a work of miracles. They were related, these two couples. The younger couple lived in the north of the Holy Land. The elder couple lived towards the south. But they were clearly related so that, in fact, the boys were probably cousins. They are described as kinsmen in the scriptures. But they were closely related and were probably cousins. Now, I want to just go through the story of these two couples and what the Holy Spirit did to them according to Matthew, Mark and Luke's Gospel. Take first Zechariah, an old man with an elderly wife and he had two dreams, two ambitions, neither of which had ever come true and it rather looked now as if neither ever would. The two ambitions were these. Zechariah was a priest and he was one of many thousands of priests who took their duties in the temple at Jerusalem. He lived just a few miles away down the valley. But he would go up to Jerusalem, he commuted to the town, and he worked in the temple as a priest. Now once a year, it was the privilege of one priest to go into the holy place all alone, into the darkness, and burn the lamp of incense at the altar. And it was the highest privilege that the ordinary priest could ever have. Now it was quite obvious that with thousands of priests, most priests would never get a chance to go in. So how did they do it? They used to toss up for it. They cast lots. And if the man got the lot that day, he would go in all by himself and the highest moment of his priesthood would occur and he would burn incense alone in the dark with God inside the holy place. And every priest hoped that one day before he retired, the lot would come to him. That was Zechariah's first ambition. The second ambition was the ambition of every priest also, to have a son because the priesthood was hereditary. And it was every priest's ambition to have a boy to whom he could pass on the privilege. But of course now his wife was elderly, long past the age of having children. He'd given up hope of one of his dreams, and he'd been a priest for probably 40 years, and he was near retirement, and he was beginning to give up hope for the other. When one day, when the priests gather together to toss up, as to who should have the lot to go into the holy place, lo and behold, the old man, Zechariah, just before his retirement, his name came up, and he went in. It must have been a most dramatic moment for this old man, alone with God in a place that nobody else could come in, a place where God lived among his people, and there he burned the incense, now the staggering experience came to him that he found he was not the only person inside there, even apart from God. And as he looked, he saw someone standing in the corner. And as he looked more closely, he realized that it was not a human being and it wasn't God. But he realized it was one of God's supernatural spirits, an angel, as they're called in the Bible. 
and he must have been terrified. And he cringed and crouched in the opposite corner and the angel said, don't be afraid. I've come to tell you that both your dreams are going to come true. Not just your dream of being in here alone with God, but your dream of having a boy. You're going to have a boy. And Zechariah very humanly said, I don't believe it. It's impossible. You see, he was thinking without the Holy Spirit. And whenever somebody says a thing is impossible, they are thinking without the Holy Spirit. Whenever a church meeting called of God to do something great begins to say, can't be done, it's impossible, it's beyond us, they are thinking without the Holy Spirit. And the word impossible is not a word in God's vocabulary. It's a word that God has never used. There are some things that are impossible for God. It's impossible for him to do wrong. It's impossible for him to sin. But he never says that word. It's as if he's saying, you must never use the word impossible when you think of God the Holy Spirit. Is anything too hard for the Lord? asks Jeremiah. Jesus said, it may be impossible with men, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And so poor old Zechariah said, impossible. And the angel said, you'll be struck dumb for nine months for saying that. That will be the proof to you and to others that God is doing something in your life. And the poor chap, when he got outside, couldn't even tell his wife what had happened. But they came together physically as old people. And she conceived. And she told her husband, I'm going to have a child. She still didn't know it was going to be a boy. That secret was locked up within him unless he wrote it down for her. Well, now that's what the Holy Spirit did for Elizabeth and for Zechariah. And then came the great day when the boy was born. And he wrote on a slate, you must call him John, because that's the name that God gave me. And immediately his tongue was loosed, and it says he was filled with the Spirit, and he began to speak. Have you noticed again and again how when people are filled with the Spirit, it usually comes out here? And Zechariah, it says, was filled with the Spirit, and began to speak. And he began to speak words that have been used in church worship, in the Book of Common Prayer every Sunday ever since, or ever since the Book of Common Prayer was produced and have been sung by Christians for 2,000 years. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and so on. Now here was Zechariah, filled with the Spirit, prophesying, speaking the words of God, words which are still used in every Anglican church to this day, every Sunday. Well, now, certain things were said about the boy to Zechariah, which we need to notice. First of all, it is said that John would be a total abstainer all his life. Jesus was not to be, but John was. It's one of the strange contrasts between the two, that John was a total abstainer and had to be in God's purpose, and Jesus was not and was called a wine-bibber by his enemies. But it's said of John that from his birth he must not touch wine or strong drink. And immediately after that it says this, that he would be the first person in the whole of history to be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Nobody had ever been filled with the Spirit as a baby before this. Samson had been a grown man when the Spirit filled him. Moses was a grown man when the Spirit filled him. And if you go through the Old Testament, people were adults before they were filled with the Spirit throughout the Old Testament. But one of the most remarkable things about John the Baptist is this. From the moment of his birth, he could do extraordinary things and say extraordinary things. And so that people would never get the idea that it was other kinds of spirits that were doing it, alcoholic spirits, he had to keep right off them so that it was utterly clear that he was intoxicated with the Spirit of God and that the strange things he would do would be of God 
and not of any other spirit at all. Well, now that boy grew up in a most unusual way. He was different from everybody else. He spent most of his time out in the desert alone. That was his school. That's where God taught him. He went to the school of God in the desert. I don't even know if he went to any other school. Probably not. But he lived alone out there. And about the age of 30, that boy began to preach. And he wore the clothes of Elijah, the same clothes that one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament had worn. Second only to Moses in the list of the prophets, everybody said Moses was the greatest prophet, Elijah was the next. And John the Baptist wore the exact clothes and lived on exactly the same food as Elijah had done. Jesus was to be the prophet like Moses, but John the Baptist was to be like Elijah, and even that was said by the angel to Zechariah. And so at the age of 30 he began to preach, and word spread, there's a prophet in Israel again. For 400 years we've waited for God to speak, and now he's speaking again. And you can go and hear him, he's out in the wilderness. And they began to flock out. People went out, they took picnic lunches, they went to hear the prophet. They'd never heard a prophet. They'd read about prophets. Their great, 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 great grandfathers had heard a prophet, but they'd never heard one. They'd only heard scribes, people expounding the scriptures. They'd not heard prophets who didn't even need a Bible, who just spoke the word of the Lord direct, and so they flocked out to hear him. Now, he didn't perform any miracles for them. The extraordinary thing about John was that his supernatural power was in what he said, not what he did. The only unusual thing he did was to baptize people by immersing them in water, which got him the nickname John the Baptizer, or John the Plunger, John the Dipper, that's what it means. And he was nicknamed as John the Baptist. And it was he who started the practice which we have kept ever since and which we practice here in this church. And we have a kind of Jordan River under this platform which we use to do what this man who was filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth did, John the Baptizer. So you can see this extraordinary man. And then one day in the crowd that came to hear him, there came the other boy, now himself a grown man. I have the feeling they had never met till then, though they had heard of each other through their mothers. But one day they met in the wilderness and the Holy Spirit began to do something even more extraordinary. Before I tell you what, I'm going to go back and pick up the threads again. I'm going to go back to the other young couple and see what the Holy Spirit was doing there. Here were a couple of betrothed teenagers. Girls were betrothed at 15 years of age. A boy became a man at 12 and assumed full adult responsibility and married around 16. So that some of our Sunday school pictures of Joseph and Mary as good middle-aged people are wide of the mark. Imagine a 16-year-old boy and a 15-year-old girl and you're nearer the mark. And here are these two teenagers and they're very happy, they're engaged to be married, which is a very serious thing. Engagement in those days was much more than going steady. It meant that the girl took the man's name at engagement. And if he died before they were married, she was regarded as a widow. It was a much more serious link. They were betrothed, but the marriage had not been consummated. That must wait some months, even some years until the official marriage ceremony. And one day this 15-year-old girl is pottering around the house. Perhaps she was at her prayers. I think probably she must have been. She was praying. And she saw somebody in the room who was not human and not God. And she realized, too, that one of God's messengers was going to say something to her. And he said the most extraordinary thing. He said, you're going to find within your body now a baby forming. Oh, but she said, now that's impossible. Same reaction as Zechariah. 
And it's the instinctive human reaction that when God says a thing, that's impossible. Do you know, it is quite instinctive in human nature when it hears of a miracle to try and explain it away. To say that's impossible, it can't happen. And of course, humanly speaking, it is. But with the Holy Spirit, anything can happen. And so she said, it's impossible. I can't have a boy. I'm betrothed, but I'm, I'm not even married. I can't conceive. And the reply of the angel was, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon your body and do this. Now, some time ago, there was an examination in the Sunday papers of some claims to virgin births. I've mentioned this before, but let me go through it again. And they examined 12 claims of women to have had babies without knowing men. They dismissed all but a handful of the claims and finally whittled the number down to two. But doctors and scientists were prepared to say that in these two cases it had probably happened and that the female ovum or egg within the womb had spontaneously begun to divide itself and had formed a baby. This is a scientific possibility. I mean, it's a physical possibility. There are other areas of nature in which virgin births happen more frequently. The sea urchin is one of them, where the female egg can begin by itself to multiply and divide and form a body. But here is the most critical and important thing. When that happens, it can only produce a girl baby. So we're dealing with something that is physically impossible. Because the angel said, you're going to have a boy. And a natural virgin birth, even if it does take place, cannot possibly produce this. So we're dealing with the miraculous here. And Mary didn't know all that I've told you now. But if she had, she'd have still said it's impossible because you said a boy. And the angel said, the Holy Ghost can do anything and will come upon you and produce the boy. Mary was so thrilled because six months previously she had heard about Elizabeth, an elderly woman who was also expecting a baby, one of her relatives, and they had thought then that something wonderful was beginning to happen. And so she went to visit Elizabeth and she made the journey. And she came into the house and Elizabeth, who was already six months through her pregnancy, the baby leapt in her womb, and it says Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit, and she prophesied, and she opened her mouth, and uh, she prophesied like this, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, and why is this granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Prophecy again, a woman prophesying. And as soon as she'd finished, Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she prophesied and said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And ever since, the Magnificat has been sung by Christians. Now you can see what's happening. It, over these few years, around the birth of these two boys, ordinary men and women were prophesying, being filled with the Spirit, opening their mouth and saying extraordinary things. Words which are so much the Word of God that we've treated them so ever since. Well, the boy was born. And we know nothing about him for 30 years, except for one little glimpse when the curtain is pulled back and we see a little glimpse of a boy who knows already that his father was not Joseph but God. That's all we know. Now it has puzzled me for a long time until really just this week. It has puzzled me, why did God not tell us anything about Jesus for 30 out of his 33 years? Why is there nothing in the Bible about his childhood? Why is there nothing about how he was related to the people of Nazareth as a carpenter, as a jobbing carpenter in the village? Why do we know nothing? 
The answer is very simple. For 30 years, the Holy Spirit was not operating through him. And therefore, the same reason that leaves out 400 years from the history of Israel leaves out 30 years from the story of Jesus. Now, that may be a staggering thought to you when I present it as bluntly as that, but let me tell you what I mean. Jesus developed physically, he grew in stature. He developed mentally, he grew in wisdom. He developed socially, he was in favor with men. He developed spiritually, he was in favor with God. He had a very good development, physically, mentally, socially, spiritually. It's every parent's desire for their child that they should do the same. And no doubt he was above average in these. The teachers in the temple noticed that his questions were very astute for his age. But the point was this. The people of Nazareth saw nothing in this boy to make them think he was more than an unusual boy. Nothing. They saw no miracles. They heard no sermons. He neither gave them the word of God nor the deeds of God. He was a boy developing into a man and working as a carpenter. And that's all they saw during the 30 years. And if you had lived at Nazareth during that time, you would not have come to the conclusion that the Son of God was living down your street. You would have said, have you noticed Joseph's boy is very forward, isn't he? He's a nice lad, well balanced, I like him. But you wouldn't have said, there's something different about that boy. You wouldn't have said it. And so for those 30 years, God tells us nothing about his son, because there is nothing to tell, except for that one glimpse, which shows that already he knew he was God's son. That's all. And even that is a private thing between himself and his parents. There's nothing else to tell. And there's nothing you need to know. And even if you did know all the details, it would purely be of human interest. It would not help you in any way to be a better Christian because the Holy Spirit was not operating. Unlike his cousin John, we are not told that he was filled with the Spirit from his birth. And so I come to the age of 30, when the curtain is lifted completely and we are asked to look in detail at his life. And it occurs when at the age of 30, notice his age, knowing what he was doing, he closed the carpenter shop for the last time in Nazareth, left it to his brothers, and walked 70 miles to the Jordan River, the lowest point on the earth's surface. And there he came to his cousin John, and he said, John, I want to be baptized. And John said, now look, I've heard about you. You're not a sinner. You don't need to wash away your sins. You've lived a good life. I'm not going to baptize you. You baptize me. But Jesus said, no, baptize me. God has told me to. It's right. And so John baptized him. Now, after that, something happened which was most unusual. After he was baptized, Jesus stood up, whether in the water or on the bank, I know not, and he prayed. And as he prayed, John saw something in the sky high up, something white and fluttering, and it came lower and lower, and it came right down and landed right on Jesus' head. He thought it was a bird at first, but as he looked closely, he realized it was only something like a bird. It was heavenly, it wasn't earthly. No earthly bird is like that. John knew because God had told him that one day he would baptize a man and after he'd baptized him he'd see the Holy Ghost come and anoint him and that would be the man. That would be the one for whom the ages had waited for a thousand years. They'd long for a spirit-filled prince. That would be the one. And John saw it and Jesus was anointed with power that day. It was only because of that that he was able to do any miracles afterwards. He couldn't do a miracle before that. He was a real human being. When the Son of God became human, he was as dependent as we are on the power of the Holy Ghost to do anything. To preach the word of God, to perform the deeds of God. And he couldn't have done it before then. 
Now immediately after his baptism, we know that he was tempted by the devil. I've read it this morning. But did you notice that it was the Holy Spirit being full of the Holy Spirit? He was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted. And do you notice that when he'd won the battle, he came in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Every other sentence you find this phrase, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, Jesus led by the Spirit, Jesus in the power of the Spirit. This is language that has not been used of him before his baptism. Because it was not true before his baptism. What was happening in the wilderness was this. Was Jesus, as a human being, to be controlled by the devil, the evil spirit, or the Holy Spirit. That was the issue. Was his ministry to be led by Satan or by the Holy Spirit? And Satan was trying desperately to say, try my way, turn these stones into bread, jump off the pinnacle of the temple, try my way, and the battle was on. Jesus, as a real human being, was at the crossroads of life, a fork in the road rather, and he could either let the devil control him or the Holy Spirit. He had ended the period of life when he was simply a human being. He was now going to be controlled by one or the other. And there comes a point in a man's life now when he reaches the fork in the road and he's either going to be controlled by the devil or by the Holy Spirit. Which is he going to be controlled by? Whose way is he going to go? He's grown up now. He's got to be controlled by one or the other. And that's the meaning of the temptation. It was only now that he began to do his miracles. He began to raise the dead. He began to heal the sick. He began to cause the deaf to hear and the blind to see and the dumb to speak. And people said, this is amazing. We've never heard a man speak like this or do things like this. Do you know what Jesus said? He said, do you know how I do my miracles? It's not my power. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. And in fact, he once said this, If I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, I'm not doing this in my own power. I'm doing it in the power of the Holy Ghost. And the day came when he came back home to his own people. Now, I can think of no severer test of a man's ministry than to go back to those who knew him before and preach. I remember the day I had to, with all my relatives sitting there, and it's not a very easy experience. And people who would say after the service, well, I knew you when you were so high, and do you remember that naughty thing you did? It's not easy to get up and talk about the righteousness of God to people who remember all the naughty things you've done. And, and so he came back to Nazareth, to his own people, and he came right back, and he stood up, and all his relatives were there, and the people it made doors and windows for. They just knew him as the carpenter and they'd heard these extraordinary things, miracles. How come they didn't believe it? Not Jesus, not the carpenter. And he stood up and they gave him the Bible or at least they had the Bible in pigeonholes in a large cabinet in scrolls, different bits. I don't know whether God the Holy Spirit guided the man to pick the right scroll but they gave him Isaiah and he opened it and he read out the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind. What is he saying? He's saying this. Do you want to know what's different about me? Do you want to know why I didn't perform a single miracle in Nazareth while I lived here and why now I'm able to do all this and give sight to the blind? I'll tell you. Since I saw you last, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what he's saying. Since I saw you last, I've been anointed with power. Since I saw you last, I'm the carpenter plus the Holy Ghost. And today, you can now see this new person. This person who's now got power to do things. Before I made you chairs and tables, now I can touch your bodies and mend them. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. What a sermon. <coughs> And he's claiming, incidentally, from the prophecy of Isaiah, to be the spirit-filled prince who was to come. No wonder they tried to throw him off a cliff immediately after the service was ended. A carpenter claiming this? They just couldn't take it, and so they tried to kill him after his first sermon at home. His preaching, too, revealed the same thing. He taught them 
as nobody else in their synagogues ever did. They heard him gladly because he taught them not as the scribes, but as somebody who had authority. Now, what do they mean by this? That was not derogatory to the scribes, because from one point of view, I am a scribe this morning. A scribe is someone who takes the word of God that somebody else has spoken and explains it to people. And I'm a scribe. I don't I hope you won't link me with the Pharisees because they usually went together, scribes and Pharisees. But I'm doing what the scribes did. I'm taking the word of God and I'm explaining it to you. But it isn't the word that I spoke. It's a word that Isaiah or Matthew or Mark or Luke spoke. That's all the scribes could do. But he taught them as one who spoke direct. He didn't quote the Bible to them. He gave them new bits of the Bible. He was adding to the Bible when he preached the Sermon on the Mount. He was giving more Bible. Not just preaching the Bible that there was, he was giving more Bible. He gave them the authority of someone who had the word of God direct from God and not through a book. And the reason is the Holy Spirit was filling this man the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to tell you what God is saying now. Now my time is gone, so I must draw two extraordinary conclusions which you may never have drawn before in your life, and they are absolutely revolutionary in your thinking about the Christian life. Here is the first conclusion. The power of Jesus which he exercised during the three years we know about, was not the power of the second person of the Trinity, but the power of the third person of the Trinity. In simpler language, when the Son of God became a human being, he was subject to the weaknesses and limitations of human strength. And therefore he was unable to perform miracles himself or to preach the direct revelation of God himself until he had been anointed by the Holy Ghost and power. And then, as Peter said years later, having been anointed with power, he went about doing good. Doing good. Not cutting someone's hedge or papering their room, but raising the lame and the dead doing good. That's an understatement. But it was because he'd been anointed with power that he did it. He had the power as a human being, not because he was divine. Now that's the first revolutionary understanding that I come to when I look at the Holy Spirit in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the second, even more revolutionary understanding is this. If that is true, and that the power Jesus had was not his own, but the power of the Spirit, then any other human being could have the same power. Now that is revolutionary. And one of the things that Jesus once said, which I find difficult to believe, and I hardly have met a man yet who really believed it, was this. The works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do. And if you read where he said that, you find he's talking about the Holy Spirit coming to the disciples. In other words, what I'm saying this morning is this. The power that Jesus had, you could have if my Bible is true. If his power was not the power of the Son of God, but the power of the Spirit, and if his miracles were only performed because he was anointed by the Holy Spirit, and if we can also be anointed with the Holy Spirit, all of which the Bible says to be true, then this can happen for us. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, once said this, he realized what I've just told you for the first time. He'd never seen it before. He thought you would have to talk about the amazing things that Jesus did as something only he could do. And then he saw what I've told you this morning and he wrote in his diary these words. 
He said, what could God not do with a man if a man would submit himself wholly and entirely to the Spirit of God? And then he wrote in his diary after that, he wrote these words, why should I not be that man? And he began to pray and he began to ask that God would anoint him with the same power that Jesus had. And one day, walking down a main street in an American town, D.L. Moody was anointed with power from on high, and his ministry began that day. And his power began that day. And D.L. Moody became a household name on both sides of the Atlantic and indeed throughout the world. And the other day, I was listening to a recorded the recorded voice of D.L. Moody after all these years. The power of the Holy Ghost is in that voice. That's how it began. My last word this morning is this. There is one text about the Holy Spirit in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that I haven't referred to yet. I've referred to all the others. But there's one I haven't referred to. One left, and it's this. Jesus was talking about prayer. He said, when you pray, say, Father in heaven, your will be done. Forgive me, me my debts. Forgive us our debts. He gave the Lord's Prayer. And then he went on to something else, and he said, if you're really going to get anything in prayer, you've got to go on asking until you get it. And he told the story of a neighbor knocking at the neighbor's door at midnight and saying, I've got visitors, give me some bread. And the person inside saying, too late, I'm in bed. No, I'm going to go on knocking until you get up and give me that bread. And the neighbor got the bread. And Jesus said, if you go on knocking, God will open. If you go on asking, you'll receive. And then he said this, and don't be afraid of what God gives to you. Because earthly fathers don't give nasty, harmful things to their children. If a child asks for a bit of bread, the father doesn't give a stone or a scorpion. And if your earthly fathers don't do that, what about your heavenly father? And then he said this, and with this I finish. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking him. And in that single sentence he was saying this, you can have the power I've got. You can have the anointing I've got. You can do the things I do. You can go on with the ministry I've begun. You can be as I am if you'll go on asking until you get the power. And there we must leave it for this morning. And next Sunday morning we'll take up the story in John's Gospel, which takes us even further into how we receive the power that Jesus had. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we've learned about the things you've done from Sunday school days. We heard about all those marvelous things, but somehow we treated them as long ago and far away. We've begun to realize this morning that they're not so long ago and not so far away because you're still alive and your spirit is available. And we thank you that you promised that the same power you had could be ours too. We can hardly begin to realize the implications of this. We can hardly begin to imagine what would happen if all of us in this church had the same power that you had. But Lord, we pray that you'll increase our faith step by step as we go through these studies until we're ready to ask and to go on asking until we receive. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen.